Civic action is a is a generic term. Within a civic action program, there's a med cap team, medical, you know, consists of doctor and nurses. Veterinarian also, right? Pardon? Veterinarian as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, they're all got their their little acronym. Yeah. The med cap, vent cap, vent cap, and, oh. and you know, uh, the whole, you know, engineers, the whole nine yards. So yeah. depending on on what kind of village and how big the village, you're going to have at the very minimum a a med cap, dent cap, and a vent cap. Of the three, surprisingly, it wasn't the med cap and the dent cap that made or that 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 helped cement a village's loyalty. It was the vent cap. The veterinarian. A team is formed the day before the mission, the, before we're to, to get out there. Uh, the convoy is put together, a number of vehicles. And then the following morning, before daylight, because it's usually about a three hour drive to get to these villages. And, and towards the end, there's no roads. It's, you know, and depending on the time of season, if it's a dry season, you're going to be choking and eating dust. If it's the wet season, you're guaranteed to be slicking and sliding in mud where you're going to have to get out and push the vehicle and all that sort of stuff. Right. Uh, or, as I quickly learned being a photographer, I went to the Thai, uh, because these these MedCap Civic Action programs were, were run by Thais with our, um, with our personnel and equipment. So that way people so perceive it as coming... People perceive it as coming from the Thai government. Yes. That yes, you're that's collaborating very important. with the Thai that. government. Okay. Yeah. Yes. The villagers have to recognize that it's a Thai operation with American helping, but the primary people there are Thai. Yeah. So with that understood, um, we I quickly learned, <laughs> I, I and other photographers quickly learned that to go over to the Thai Air Force side of the house and we would trade photographs of the pilot and the crew and the next to their bird and all that for a ride out and a ride back, maybe for a, an extra roll of film or two, you know, trade was a big thing in the military. So we would trade film and photos to catch a ride out. That would mean that instead of me driving out, the right, you know, having to endure three hours in a Jeep, you know, bouncing up and down or eating dust or, 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 you know, having to pull it, pull it out of the mud, I took a chopper ride into the village, um, got there before anybody else did, and, and got, was able to set up and take photographs. Um, <laughs> the other thing about it was that because it was a Thai American operation, the like I said, once everything got into the village, they all set up. The villagers knew they were coming, um, and other villagers from village villagers from surrounding villages would show up because this was a big thing. In the 70s still, Thailand, rural Thailand was very rural. People still wore, uh, the women wore out uh, um, spe special uh, tube dresses that they made themselves. Men wore a loincloth like um, uh, item of clothing that described the village that they were from. Um, T-shirts and American clothes was only common to villagers that were visited by civic action teams. Otherwise, they wore traditional clothing, um, you know, things like television, radio, uh, sliced bread, all that, you know, all that stuff that now is very common was not available. So you get, you know, you get to the village. They're there waiting for you. The dental team sets up in one spot, the medical team in another, and then the veterinarian. Now, remember I said the veterinarian probably made or break, broke how that village was going to react in the future. Mm -hmm. To these villagers, or their primary means of economy is rice, and their wealth is measured in water buffalo and pigs. Mm -hmm. If the water buffalo gets sick, or the water buffalo goes lame, or if the water buffalo, something happens to it, they can't harvest the rice. They can't plow the field to harvest the, to the rice. If the pigs get sick and die, their source of meat protein gets taken away. So the person that can cure the problem with the water buffalo and the pig 
is the veterinarian. And if the veterinarian does his job, or you know, that would know her, his job and succeeds in curing the buffalo, fixing its lame uh, feet, whatever, um, stop it, stops the pigs from dying, the villagers then are saved. And so therefore, they're going to present their loyalty to the government for allowing their village to su succeed. So you can see why the veterinarian became a very, very important figurehead in these teams. The other thing that made, that was of interest was the dentist. Now, the reason being that most of these people had never had any dental work at all. And so the only thing that you can do for them, you know, you're not going to put cavities, not going to fill cavities, and you certainly aren't going to make braces. You're going to pull teeth. That's primarily all you're doing. You're pulling out all, and you know, many of these villages, their teeth were just, oh, abscessed, nasty, and that was the only way to do it. The dentist that went with us was, it was a dental technician, actually. This guy had it down to a science. He would set up shop, slowly project all his stuff out, you know, put it out, you know, take the uh, Novocaine needle, which was about that big, mm. and, you know, do the squirt thing. And the villagers, this was yeah. reality TV for them. Um, they would sit around with awe as this guy would do the, or set up all his tools. And then, you know, there'd be a whole lineup of people there. And because this dentist was a farong, a foreigner, they were going to get, the people who were going to have their teeth pulled were going to get a lot of status amongst their villagers because they were being helped and worked on by a foreigner. And so they would line up. Uh, he would give them the Novocaine, you know, squirt the whole thing, you know, and then dramatically take the tongs, you know, look around for the tooth, open the, you know, reach in there and then pow and then lift that tooth. Everybody would jump up in the air, you know, and, and they would clap, you know, because he, the, the, you know, this guy's tooth now is gone. And then he would give them some um, medicine for, you know, for the pain and all that, send him on his way next, you know, wow. and it would go on for about hour after hour. And to the villagers, that was, that was a drama that they, you know, would never see again until the next, you know, the next visit. Did you, um, have a sense you know you're you're photographing all this oh yeah part of your yeah. job is to pay attention and to you know to document all of this did you have a sense that this um you know that it was that it was successful that you know oh yeah that, you know tyler oh, yeah. ended this up was... not having problems with the communists and this played a role in that oh big time this was i wish I wish we could have done more of this. This was the real hearts and minds. This was the, because they got to see us as people and um, we got to see them as people, not as um, enemy or weird, you know, doing weird things, but behaving the same way. Kids running around just like they would back home. You know, um, I, I sent you a couple of photos of a doctor surrounded by kids. I'll tell you what, that doctor, I was so impressed with him. He, the kids were absolutely frightened of this farong that was going to examine them. You know, um, chest problems was a big thing amongst the kids. Uh, um, and so he was going to, to examine them and they didn't want any part of it. So what he did was he took out his, um, his tool, his stethoscope and all that, and he put it around. And then he kind of looked, you know, went on himself and all you know, that, and the kids were getting real interested. So he got one of the boys and he said, you know, come here. And the boy kind of slowly came up there and then he placed a stethoscope in his ears and put it on his chest and the kid could hear his heartbeat. And the kid was just all excited and all these other kids wanted hey, me, 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 me. So he, you know, he got them all um, totally unfrightened, lined them up and then you know, was able to proceed with examining them and they just loved them. You know, he would do, he would tell them jokes. They didn't understand what he was talking about, but they would laugh, you know, and he would laugh. Um, he would do funny, you know, uh, signs with his fingers and stuff. He would take out a, uh, a throat, uh, you know, uh, suppressor and uh, he'd take up a little pe a pebble and, and fire at one of the kids, you know, and it just, it was incredible. He had those kids yeah. totally, totally in his hands. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that we needed more of. Then on top of that, here's the other part that was cool. 
was that one of the older women um, had a very terrible skin condition. And this American nurse, this was before the days of wearing gloves, took, a, uh, took the cream and slowly applied it, showed her how to apply it to her skin, and then gave her the, 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 uh, the cream. The lady had never had anything like this done before. And her way, you know, and so she showed her thanks by doing the way, you know, very deep way, the deeper the way, the deeper the bow, the more respect you're showing to your, to, you know, to that person. Um, mm -hmm. So I saw that. A group of, of um, it, it, I remember I said how we catch a ride with the, with the uh, Thai helicopters into the villages. Well, American helicopters would also fly in. And this one unit flew in into a village that we went to, A, to, to, to participate in a, in, a, in a civic action program, but we were also there because we were that cr the crew of the helicopter picked up a young girl who had an acute appendicitis pen, uh, uh, and flew her to, um, to the Air Force base and where they did an emergency appendectomy on her, saved her life and flew her back. And so the villagers were honoring that, that um, crew with what they called a, uh, a, what we called a string ceremony. And that was gonna happen after the, 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 the program. So what that just consisted of was where the, uh, the villagers would set up a table with fruit and stuff like that. And um, the crew would, would be around this table. There'd be a, a, a priest, a, a Buddhist priest, and a string would be strung all around everybody in the village that was there. And then the ceremony would have indicated was that now these, these crew members were now adopted to, into that village. And whatever good spirits that village had were now being passed on through the string to the, to the crew members so that good blessings and good karma would follow them. Mm. Um, that's the kind of stuff that needed to occur. You know, when I saw, you know, there was a good, good feeling by everybody. I have, a, I think I sent you one photograph. One of the crew members had to stand by the helicopter, you know, because they couldn't leave their bird unattended. Right. And the villagers knew that. And they brought to him just this armful of bananas, papayas, mangoes, pineapple. They, I got this photograph, this guy standing there with this mm. big armload of fruit just for him. Mm. You know, uh, I sent that picture into Seventh Air Force News, and I think it made one of the covers. But it was, you know, that's that's the kind of rapport that that occurred, and I think that's what was more that was lacking rather than 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 it should. Yeah, and underlying all of it, I mean, there's there's the just the the pure humanitarian oh yeah here, but underlying it is this. You know, there is this concern about the spread of communism, and one of the ways we can stop the spread of communism is to capture the loyalty of these folks, and here's a way we can do that. And, you know, as you're, as you're talking, and I'm thinking about that, you know, because I think sometimes, you know, there is a, a tendency among some folks to say, you know, that all this talk about communism was just a, a cover for something else, and, and it may have been in, in some respects, but but I think the story you're telling indicates that, you know, there was, however complicated and messed up the whole Vietnam situation got, there was this underlying reality that there was a deep-seated desire to prevent the spread of communism. And the way things work out in South Vietnam, I and mean, obviously I, I think most people would agree in one way or another, it got off the rails and, you know, it just obviously didn't work, but it, you know, but it's not just happening there. It's it's even happening in Thailand because we're worried about the domino, you know, and so we want to prevent that from happening. So, yeah, and I've heard, you know, I've heard about civil, you know, civil action programs in South Vietnam. That the the trouble there, of course, is that the Viet Cong, when the doctors leave, the Viet Cong can come in, and and so th things get so complicated there. That was. That was a problem. That was less of a problem, I think, in Thailand. And I think that's why it was so successful, was yeah. because the Thai government, militarily or uh, or or, or the uh, the civil government with the police forces and all that, was such that it had a handle uh, onto um, onto any 
movements of people that didn't belong in that district. Sure. And they were able to control it much more so. Plus the fact that even though with the, with the corruption in Thailand, it was far less of a corrupt uh, uh, state than Vietnam. I mean, Vietnam was so corrupt that it was beyond hope even to, to try and, and augment any meaningful change for any long period of time. So yeah, it was apples and oranges, but it did work. That's the important thing that I noticed in Thailand was that it did work. Being technically speaking, Thailand was considered a uh, non-combat zone. So if you could afford to, many of the uh, uh, servicemen lived off, off base. We had our bungalows and all that that we lived in. And I joined up with, uh, with uh, a guy that I met there and um, we had a bungalow together. And I think what I really remember most about it is that we, we were able to support a whole household of people that took care of it. I mean, you know, cause we were never there except mm -hmm. when we were off duty. Yeah. So we had a, we had a person that did the house cleaning. We had a person who did the cooking. We had a person who, who provided security. Um, and, 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 and we paid them to do the job, the mama son, or we paid the mama son who then paid them. But I think what I, I, well, the thing I remember most is the fact that one of them wanted to show us his village. And so he uh, got a taxi for us. I guess that guy was a friend of his. I'm still not sure because I remember paying him, but I don't think it was he paying for, for a taxi service as much as for his time. And so we took a whole day and we went north to Savannah, which is north of us. And we went to this little small village. And um, this person wore the best uh, Western style clothes that he had, you know, nice pair of slacks, a shirt and all that. And, yeah. and we did too. We tried to wear nice clothes too, I remember. And we brought gifts with us. Um, I remember I brought like two pack, two cartons of cigarettes. Cigarettes were big, big thing. And American cigarettes were almost impossible to get in these villages up there, mm. you know. And there, yeah. so if you give somebody a carton of American cigarettes, you know, you're really uh, showing respect. So I had a couple of cartons, and I remember that I had a couple of cartons of cigarettes as a gift, and then. Uh, uh, so we went up there and we got introduced and everything. And I remember how proud he was because he was showing off to the village and his parents. His father was the carpenter of the village, mm. um, showing him uh, that that he had succeeded by having these friends who were uh, who were, who were who were showing their gratitude, you know, by presenting these gifts and all. That. And I remember him taking us into uh, into the into the house and they had we had a they had a table a food there, the best, I'm sure it was the best, you know, I know it was pork and fish. I remember that. Um, a lot of greens, the Thais eat almost anything and everything. <laughs> and there was a lot of greens, but fresh fruit, um, of course, uh, rice. There was like two different types of rice, the, the, the normal white rice, and then what we call sticky rice, which is a, a sweet rice, which is mm. delicious. You roll it into a ball and pop it in your mouth. Um, and, and I remember um, what, what a nice family time it was. And um, to this day, I could see the glow in, in, in I'm going to say Tang, Tang's face and, and how proud he felt that of, of being able to show us off to, the, to, this, to his parents and to the village. And uh, that was one, that's a memory I have.